welcome everybody. Um, my, my name is Ryan Miller uh, with the University of Minnesota Extension, and uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you today uh, to the uh, Strategic Farming Let's Talk Crops. Um, this is the first uh, in the series that we've got this winter. We'll be running the program weekly, uh, again, kind of this time format in the morning. Uh, and over the years, um, we've had the chance to run the strategic uh, farming program in, in different kind of formats. Uh, we started back uh, with kind of a deep dive in-person workshop session where we'd spend a few hours on a topic and, and really dig in on it. Uh, and then last year, uh, we switched to an online format where we did a brief uh, presentation uh, followed by some discussion. And then this year, we finally, we've, we've uh, changed it again. So we're going to be a little more frequent. We're going to be weekly here through March. Um, and we're really, uh, we're really seeking not to drown you with information. So we're going to have a really brief update or, or, or presentation at the beginning. Uh, and then it's really going to give us a chance to dig in and answer questions and have some discussion. Uh, the thought being that many of us recognize that throughout the years doing educational programming, uh, some of the best uh, interaction we have with people is, uh, is after we're done with the presentation, maybe eating lunch or in the hallway where we get to, uh, you know, see what's on your mind, uh, discuss some questions you might have. And so that's going to be the goal today is try to facilitate some discussion, uh, answer some questions. And so we had a chance for people to enter uh, some of their questions ahead of uh, uh, the show today. Uh, and so we've got some of those in the bag, uh, but if you do uh, develop questions as we're going along through the program, we'd really encourage you to uh, ask those. You can enter them in the chat window. Uh, if you go down to the bottom toolbar on your Zoom, you can either enter them in chat or the Q&A session, uh, and, uh, and we'll try to address those as we go along. Uh, we don't have a terribly long time today, uh, so we're going to get started here pretty quick, but I do want to bring up the fact that we've got a number of, uh, of uh, different sessions, and for the next few weeks, uh, we're starting today with corn hybrid selection. Uh, next week, we'll be doing soybean variety selection, uh, and then we're going to talk about herbicide trait packages uh, the week after, uh, and then uh, the week after that, kind of looking forward, uh, we're going to talk about P and K. I'll actually be back on uh, monitoring that, uh, that session. Uh, Jeff Fetch is going to update us with a, a product he's been leading on uh, banning versus broadcasting. And Dan Kaiser will be there, uh, give us a chance to talk about P and K fertility and some of the questions that might be on your mind. So uh, with that, uh, we're going to get started. Uh, we've got a few people on today to help lead the discussion. So I'll be here. Uh, we've got Tom Holberstadt, who you might see up in your window there. Uh, he's a research scientist at the Southern Research and Outreach Center. Uh, it's got a long history working with herbicide trials and variety trials. And so we'll, uh, we'll have him to ask questions too. We've also got our current corn agronomist from uh, St. Paul, uh, Jeff Coulter. Uh, he's done a wide range of, of, uh, of research trials related to, to corn production in the state of Minnesota. And so, uh, so we'll rely on him uh, with some of our questions we're asking, as well as he's going to give us a, a, an introduction or a brief kickoff. We also have Dean Malvik, who's a plant pathologist uh, focusing on row crops, both soybean and corn. And so uh, we've got him here to kind of deal with the uh, disease-related components of hybrid selection and, and what uh, host plant resistance uh, uh, might be important as far as disease management. Uh, things that are absent, I mentioned we're going to talk about herbicide traits in a couple of weeks. Uh, so we're not going to dig into that. Uh, in addition, we're not going to talk a lot about insect traits. Uh, Ken Osley be on later uh, in the course of these discussions, and so we'll we'll kind of pull those out so we don't have to dig into those today. Uh, but those will be discussed at a later uh, date. So uh, with that, I think Jeff, we're going to ask uh, you had a brief presentation to share uh, some slides with us, and if you wanted to get started, we'd uh, like that. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. And I'm just going to give a brief presentation of uh, some things on corn hybrid selection, uh, some slides that Tom Hoverstead and I developed. So hybrid selection is one of the most important agronomic de decisions affecting corn yield and profitability. One of the sources of information on corn hybrid selection is the University of Minnesota corn performance trials, which are led by Tom Hoverstead of the Southern Research and Outreach Center. Companies pay an entry fee to enter a hybrid into a selected zone for testing. Within a zone, a hybrid is tested at each of three locations, and at each location, all hybrid entries are replicated three times. This slide shows the yield difference among hybrid entries at the Hutchinson location, 
which is in central Minnesota. At this location, hybrids between 88 and 106 relative maturity are tested annually. And this shows the performance of those hybrids from 2019 to 2013. So the first column on the left is the year. The next column is the number of entries per year that are tested in these trials. The third column from the left is, shows the average yield of the top 10 yielding hybrids in that trial in each year. The next column shows the average yield of the bottom 10 yielding hybrids in the trial in each year. And then the last column shows the difference in the yield, the difference between the average yield of the top 10 and the average yield of the bottom 10 hybrids in each year. And the key take home point from this slide is that the yield difference among hybrids is huge. Uh, the yield difference was 43 to 53 bushels per acre in five years, 69 bushels per acre in one year, and 92 bushels per acre in another year. There are few agronomic decisions, if any, that have such a large impact on yield. In addition, seed is one of the most costly inputs for corn production. This table here shows the a range in seed prices that one may receive after all the discounts. So at the high end, the seed price is around $260 per 80,000 seeds, which equates to about $113.75 at a planting rate of 35,000 seeds per acre. On the low end, a seed price is around $100 per 80,000 seeds, which is around $43.75 per acre. Now the difference in seed price per acre between these two extremes is around $70 per acre. And at 450 a bushel, that equates to about 15 and a half bushels per acre. So if one could obtain similar yield with reduced cost, that results in greater profit. Alternatively, one could accept some yield reduction with a lower seed cost and maintain equivalent or greater profit. In this example, a yield reduction of 15 and a half bushels per acre or less. However, the, the difference in seed cost in this example is partially due to insect resistant traits. So one would need to consider scouting and potential treatment costs with the less expensive seed. One thing to do is to use hybrid trial results from multiple sources. Uh, these include universities, Minnesota and neighboring states, Minnesota Corn Growers Association, cooperative elevators, technical colleges and FFA clubs, the first trials, results from farmer group trials and seed companies and trials where hybrids are replicated at least three times and that also compare hybrids from multiple companies are of particular value. One thing with hybrid selection is that it is important to stay current or you are behind. 1.8 bushels per acre per year is the average yield increase based on year of hybrid commercial release. And this is from a study that was published in Crop Science that looked at hybrids released in the US and Southern Canada between 1986 and 2016. Some current considerations for hybrid selection include optimizing your relative maturity for the, where you're located. Generally, the growing degree day requirements of selected hybrids should be at least 100 to 200 growing degree days less than your average. A good plan for selecting hybrids is to choose two to three hybrids within each of two to three maturity groups. And hybrids of a given maturity group have grain moisture that is within about two percentage points of each other. And then within one of these maturity groups, choose hybrids that have high and stable yield, lower grain moisture, and less stock lodging. Other factors to consider as needed include suitability for corn on corn, emergence and early season vigor, green snap rating, root strength, drought tolerance, and tolerance to insect pests, herbicides, and diseases. The goal of hybrid selection is to predict future performance. And therefore we wanna use results from many trials and use multi-location averages. When possible, use LSD values to determine if differences in yields among hybrids are statistically significant. In addition, a percentile or yield index can help to assess consistency in performance of hybrids across trials with different hybrids. Now a percentile is when you take the data, you sort it from lowest to highest, and then you establish a cutoff. And if we're using the 75th percentile, that cutoff would be where 25% of the hybrids are above that cutoff and 75% of the hybrids are below. Alternatively, some trials report a yield index. And this is calculated by taking the yield of the hybrid that you're interested in, divided by the average of the yield 
the average yield of all hybrids in that trial and then converting it to a percentage. Now these percentiles or yield indexes become useful when you're trying to look at the consistency of performance of a hybrid across multiple trials where the hybrids may differ. The hybrids differ in the ones that are entered into the trials. And the things to think about is that a hybrid that is within the desired percentile or yield index in all trials would be one that has consistent performance. And we want to be wary of hybrids that have inconsistent performance. The best indicator of future performance is performance across multiple locations with soils and growing conditions that are similar to those of your fields. And this is because we cannot predict next year's growing conditions. In the last few years, the number of hybrids that are conventional hybrids without any transgenic traits has been relatively high in the University of Minnesota corn performance trials. This shows the results of the yield results of hybrids that were entered in the trials in the central Minnesota, particularly for the Hutchinson, Minnesota location. And the way to look at this slide is we've got the yield reported on the left, and on the bottom, we've got the hybrids grouped into transgenic trait categories. So there were some hybrids that had no transgenic traits, some had herbicide resistance only, others had both herbicide resistance and European corn borer resistance, and then there was a fourth group that had herbicide resistance, European corn borer resistance, and corn rootworm resistance. And this number at the bottom of the figure shows the number of hybrid entries for each of those groups. And the yield data are plotted using box plots. In brief, the lower line in the box is the 25th percentile, meaning 25% of the yields are below it and 75 are above it. The line in the middle of the box is the 50th percentile, which means half of the hybrids are above it, half are below it. And the line at the top of the box is the 75th percentile. And the take home point is that the wider the box, the greater the variability in the yield within that hybrid category. However, the box width is also influenced by the number of hybrids in that category. For example, the hybrids that only had herbicide resistance, there were only four of those. Therefore, it results in a, in a, a wider box. The variability is magnified. But if we just step back and look at the results, uh, we see that the performance of the conventional hybrids in general is quite good in compared to the performance of the other trait categories. However, in 2019, there was a little more variability in the yields of the conventional hybrids compared to those of the other two uh, trait groups on the right side of the figure. We can also look at the yield results from 2018 at Hutchinson. And again, we see a similar thing. We, in the 2018, we had 19 hybrids that were conventional compared to 34 that had herbicide and European corn borer resistance and 17 that had herbicide, European corn borer, and corn rootworm resistance. And in 2018 at Hutchinson, again, we see that the performance of the conventional hybrids was competitive to that of the other trait groups, and perhaps a little better than uh, the group that had herbicide, European corn borer, and corn rootworm resistance. And one thing that I do wanna mention on, with regards to this slide is that the hybrid trials that the university does typically use a crop rotation. They always have soil insecticide applied for corn rootworm and they have scouting for European corn borer and treatment if needed. Thus the trials are essentially evaluating genetics in the absence of significant pest pressure. And one thing that we would like to drive home is that base genetics determine yield and traits for insect resistance protect yield in the presence of a pest. So with that, that's uh, everything I wanted to present for today. And uh, I will stop sharing my screen and we will get over to the discussion. All right, thanks, Jeff. I guess I'm gonna start off with one quick question to Jeff. Um, you know, through your experience with some of these hybrid trials, uh, what kind of uh, range do you typically see with um, yield? So when we're testing, you know, genetic potential of hybrids, what kind of variability do we get? Because we talk about being such a huge component of determining our, our success in terms of profitability, what kind of ranges do you see with different trials? 30 to 50 bushels per acre is common. Okay, so you, you do see pretty typically, you see some pretty wide uh, variety. Another kind of curiosity is I noticed with a couple of your box plots there, 
when we look at the the um it seemed like on the uh particularly the insect traded hybrids when we look at those uh figures uh those were the ones that tend to have those kind of outliers the really high yield and the really low yield do you, do you know any uh is there any explanation on that or is it just some kind of random chance that happened with those uh, I think in those situations, it was just kind of random chance that there was one hybrid that was really stellar, and then maybe there was one hybrid that was yielding a little lower in that group. It's kind of it's interesting because most the, the consistency side kind of looked better in those plots, and then all of a sudden you had a couple of really wide swings. But just found that kind of interesting. Um, I guess I, I want to kind of move over now to, to Tom there. Tom has got a long history uh, running uh, hybrid trials and, and a variety of different research trials at the Southern Research Outreach Center as well as across the state. And I uh, want to chat with Tom a little bit about, uh, you know, what a philosophy might be with or a framework uh, for picking a hybrid. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, where do you start? You've got, uh, you've got lots of options out there to, to choose from. Uh, including that's kind of confused by the fact that the hybrid might be sold under different brand names. And so where's a person to kind of get started, Tom? Do you have uh, any thoughts on that? Well, I do have a lot of thoughts. I have a lot of experience with it too. And first of all, I think Jeff mentioned it pretty, pretty well that choosing a hybrid, first of all, it's one of the most yield influencing decisions you make all year and probably the hardest one to get right. Jeff said 30 to 50 bushels is, is normal. And I've looked, you know, I personally have a attachment to our trials because we take care of them. And I looked at Iowa, South Dakota, Wisconsin, you see the same kind of range top to bottom. So that's a fact of life that those are the kind of differences you're, you're looking at. If you were, if you made that kind of mistake with nitrogen or something at the end of the year, you'd say, well, I should have done something different, but hybrid, you could, you could go through all the data, pick a hybrid and be 30 to 50 bushels off and, and say, you know, that's, that's the way it happened. So to minimize that, um, I would look at a lot of trials, of course, ours being one, um, being here in Southern Minnesota, I'm located in Waseca. I have no problem looking at Iowa's tests for things that I'm interested, Wisconsin, South Dakota. I wouldn't go as far away as Nebraska. But uh, one thing I think you just need to turn your head a little bit, it's human nature to look at trials that are close to home and look at a trial that's just down the road and look at one that did well in there and say, that's for me. But keep this in mind that what you're trying to do when you select hybrids is not look at history. You're trying to predict the future. And always the best indicator of the future is as many location averages as you can get because next year's conditions are not likely to be the same as this year right on your farm. So you want to get something that performs well across a range of environments. And I think that helps. So look at university trials. There's other independent trials. There's corn grower trials. Um, there's a lot of area educational high schools and uh, technical schools do trials. Co-ops do trials. So there's a lot of sources of information. And I think it's also good to watch out for things that do poorly because knowing when something does poorly is probably just as good as knowing what's on the top. So if you can say you're interested in a hybrid and in two or three trials you see it in, it was near the bottom, that's a red flag. Maybe ask some questions about that. So try to predict the future. We use history to predict the future and that's, uh, that's what we're trying to do with these trials and provide the best we can. Independent trials are good because uh, we have no stake in the game. So I, I do like that. In the Tom, I think uh, Larry asked a question over here in the chat, and I think you just addressed that. The, this whole idea of uh, instead of focusing in on just one location close to home, it's looking at multiple, what we might call in the research world, site years to try to get a feel for the unpredictability of next year in terms of climate and 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 growing conditions, it's probably best to have something that's experienced and perform well under a multitude of different environments. And so I think, I think what you just said there, 
kind of uh, help to answer that question. Um, it goes against it goes against your instincts. Your instincts are to look at that trial that's right down the road and want to duplicate it, but that's very hard to do when you're when next year is going to be different. Okay. Um, I do want to make mention that we do, if you click on chat, there is a chat window. I put a number of links there, uh, uh, including the lineup for our next series of, of discussions we're going to have each week, uh, as well as some uh, links to uh, the results that you guys did, the variety trial, both the corn grain and the uh, corn silage for 2020, as well as a general link to the, you can look at all the past years. Uh, they're all up on that website. And so you can, you can take a, a look at that. I do see that Dean Melvick uh, joined us, and uh, I wanted to ask Dean a quick question uh, in relation to corn hybrid selection and some of the diseases we see in Minnesota. Um, what are, when we start thinking about host plant resistance and hybrid selection, what are some of the, the big ones to think about when we're looking at picking a corn hybrid for, you know, helping to manage the disease? Yeah, uh, you know, Jeff mentioned that, and we'll put that on his list of factors that are important of course, diseases are, are very inconsistent from location to location and year to year. You know, we can all think back about 10 years when Goss's wilt became a significant problem across a big swath of the state. And certainly a lot of the hybrids then had, were very susceptible. Now many of them have resistance. And so that, that disease, for example, is one that still poses a threat for sure. So if we have susceptible hybrids, out in the landscape, you know, there is a risk of them suffering some loss from Goss's wilt. Uh, fortunately, most of our hybrids have good resistance. So we, we've gotten around that big problem that we had before, but certainly that's one of them and that we have a good solution to with resistance. Um, Northern corn leaf blight is another one. You know, most hybrids have resistance to it. We've had outbreaks of that disease here and there scattered across the state at time to time. And you know, we're not sure why that happens. Some of those have uh, decent ratings for northern corn leaf blight. Um, so, but regardless, you know, having a good level of resistance to that is important too. You know, some of the others, you know, eye spot, the stock rots, um, you know, the typical trait package is, is usually enough to cover most of the problems. Um, you know, some of the newer problems that are coming along like bacterial leaf streak, not as big of a problem on hybrid dent corn and sweet corn, but still is noticeable at times. And then of course, tar spot is, is on the horizon and beyond the horizon here in, in Minnesota in the Southeast. And there's no real resistance to that that we can purchase and select at this point, but that will be coming. And, and there are differences at this point in time in, in tolerance, although we can't definitely say which ones are most tolerant based on our limited data. Uh, thanks for the comments, Dean. Uh, we're going to keep moving through uh, some of the questions we have both got prior to the, the session today, as well as some that have popped in the Q&A box. The first one, back to Jeff, um, I made some comments about these outliers with your box plots. I think this is in relation to that. Uh, the person's curious here if these outliers are the same between years. Do you, have you looked at that? Are these the ones that end up being outliers, are they similar between years, or is it just not the case. No, it is different between years. And then that one is done. Uh, we did have one pop into the chat variety. I don't know if we have the right person on to discuss this today, but uh, um, looking at the trials done with in-season nitrogen applications and uh, in different varieties, uh, they're curious about um, if anyone has information on uh, varieties responding differently to those in-season uh, applications of nitrogen. And if not, maybe we'll have to follow up. But Phyllis, uh, if you could help us figure out uh, Jason's email there, maybe we can follow up with him later. Um, well, I think in our trials, what we're, what we're trying to address with, with our hybrid trials is genetic yield potential. We're not looking for nitrogen interactions. So I will say this, I don't overdo it with nitrogen, but we do what we can to not make nitrogen a limiting factor. So we put them in an environment that really just, I was telling Ryan earlier, in my experience with research, trying to accomplish one objective with a trial is when you get good results and to try and layer another objective in there to look at 
in season nitrogen as a component of the trial, it, uh, it washes down what you're really trying to get. So we'll refer that to the nitrogen people. All right, thanks, Tom. I guess it's, you know, uh, the variety selection or hybrid selection is such a complicated thing. Why do you want to complicate it further with, with response? But yeah, definitely uh, an area of interest is in season nitrogen application. So we'll, uh, we'll hold that back and, uh, and uh, uh, try to address that in future episodes. I think this next question we've uh, answered looking at multiple years, uh, you've stressed, uh, both Jeff and Tom have stressed the importance of, of that uh, um, issue. Uh, there is a question here, and I did allude to this, Tom, earlier on, this whole concept that oftentimes a hybrid is sold under different brand names. So the actual plant type uh, or, or variety, I guess, uh, is sold with different branding, with different names on the market. Uh, do we do any uh, 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 legwork, I guess, on that to try to make sure uh, uh, these things are actually different? Or is that uh, something you've been concerned with? Well, here's what I know about that. And it's, I'm an outsider in the seed industry but I've been around long enough and talked to a lot of people. It's true. There's a number of companies that sell the same cross. You might say, you know, inbred A crossed with inbred B to make hybrid AB. That can be sold under a number of different brand names. Now, that doesn't mean they all have the same potential because there are foundation seed companies out there that do this for people. I could go to a foundation seed company and say, I wanna to sell Tom's hybrid A, and it's gonna be this inbred by this inbred. You do it all for me, I'm just gonna sell it. Well, you can do that economically where they use machinery to do the detasseling and make the seed and it's kind of a, a cheaper version, they can do it the Cadillac method where they hand detassel and really look for purity. You can also cross inbred A with inbred B using the male and female differently and it all affects things. So just because it's the same cross doesn't always indicate that it has the same yield potential. Handling and conditioning and the entire process of of creating a, a hybrid seed for you to plant really can differ across the board. So I wouldn't look at one hybrid or I wouldn't get that information to know exactly what the genetics of this is and say it is the same no matter what brand it's sold under. That's my experience in that. Okay, uh, we do have a, a, a question here. Um, from Doug, uh, he's asking, can I compare two varieties that are not in the same plots? And I, I think we go back to Tom, some of your comments there that that's absolutely necessary, that it, we encourage you to look at the same hybrid in multiple plots uh, as, a, as, a, as a method. So uh, I'll just uh, quickly answer that one. Uh, uh, Ryan, could I also comment on that? Yeah. So one of, the, one of the issues with that is the same hybrids are not in all of the, in each trial. And that's where the yield index or the uh, a percentile become important for helping one to assess, is this hybrid typically near the top of the list, near the bottom, where is it at? And, you know, if it's in the upper part of the list in many trials, that's an indication that this is a pretty, pretty good performing hybrid. And then you may also be looking at another one and maybe that other hybrid is towards the low, lower end of the list in many trials but there are a few trials where these two hybrids are specifically compared uh, against each other. And so that's where the, the yield index or the, uh, or the percentile thing become important for kind of discerning uh, stability, good, yield potential. Good point, Jeff. Uh, do you want to just take a second and, and, and describe yield index? I totally uh, forgot to mention that. And I think that's a good point that, uh, you know, what, when you look at a yield index, what does that mean for a state? Exactly. Yeah, so the Minnesota Corn Grower Association trials yield, use the yield index, and that's calculated as 
the yield of a hybrid divided by the average yield of all hybrids at a given trial. And then it's reported as a percentage. So it's, it's pretty much showing the, the yield potential of that hybrid at that site. So above 100%, you're, you're above that kind of average and below you would be below the, the mean for that particular yeah. site. Yeah, and typically one would want to be looking for something like 105% or maybe higher as kind of their threshold of where they want to be. Okay, excellent, Jeff. Uh, let's see here. Another question, is it better to choose many varieties for an average year or choose less and try to keep them more consistent? How do you choose across a range of soil types? It's a pretty broad question. Do one of you guys want to tackle that one? Well, I guess I'll just start by saying that on the first website, there's a new product search tool that allows one to look up all of the trials that an individual product was tested in and then sort by factors such as soil texture, tillage, and previous crop. Uh, a good guideline is to try to choose two to three hybrids within each of two to three relative maturity groups, where a relative maturity group would be a group of hybrids that is within two percentage points of grain moisture of each other. Okay, um, and then the final question we've got in today's chat box here. Uh, it, it, again, it's, it's more of a comment than a question, I guess. It's, uh, you know, we see such a rapidly changing hybrid environment, like the, the options change so much from year to year that it's difficult to deal with, you know, how do I select something? Because there's not, there's never really a long history of a, of a hybrid with things changing so rapidly. And do you guys have any thoughts on that or? I mean, is that just the, the thing that we deal with and we can't really do much but look at trial data and try to try to make some, some good uh, determinations? Well, I think you're right, Ryan. If you, if you go back about three years, uh, we don't see many hybrids lasting. Two years is kind of as, as long as I see a hybrid lasting in our trial. And just by experience, uh, in the industry, the life of a hybrid is probably a good four years. Um, Jeff mentioned 1.8 bushels per acre per year is how fast yields are advancing. I think that's a conservative estimate. I've, been, I've got data on our trials where we're doing the same thing, trying to address yield potential here in Waseca and the rate of increase is more like two and a quarter bushels per acre per year. So to really look at several years data history, you're already putting yourself five to, if you, look, well, if you want to look at three years history, you better be seven and a half bushels better and that's hard to do. So that's, that's how fast things are moving. And that's why looking at this year's data is probably the best thing you can do for next year's trials. Okay, and uh, so guys, the, ahead of this, we did have a bunch of questions come in and I think we've talked quite a bit about this. Um, you know, the goal of a, a yield trial is to kind of try to find the greatest potential in terms of genetics. And so we kind of take away some of these factors with soil type and tillage type, but there were some questions. I don't know if anyone wants to provide any little bit more insight on, you know, these issues with, well, I'm a strip tiller versus conventional till. Uh, is there any other comments you guys want to add uh, with regards to hybrid selection and some of these other factors, soil type, or maybe it's a production, you know, like the tillage example, strip till versus conventional. Um, uh, any comments that you want to uh, lay out there anymore, or, or do you think we've covered that? Well, it's, it's hard to address that in the, in the trials that we do. Say you want to look at strip till or no till also. Um, to get that kind of information takes a few, a few environments, a few years. And if you do that, we just said the life of a hybrid isn't that long. So it's hard to, it's hard to do hybrid trials that address that. So I think getting information that comes from the seedsman who sees a lot of environments in the years. I, I would guess your average uh, seedsman sees the same hybrid in hundreds, maybe thousands of environments. 
then they take that information and put it together and say, okay, this one seems to be always doing better in no-till than the other ones. That's information that I don't think you can glean from our trials. I think step one is find something that has high genetic yield potential, then go to the seedsman, say, I'm interested in this hybrid. What do you think about it on no-till? And he probably will have a pretty good feel for it. Okay, good points, Tom. Uh, we do have a question here, and I don't know if uh, we've got exactly the right folks to answer this, but does anyone want to address this? Uh, is there a relation between yield and digestibility? Yeah, I could address it. So there's not a clear relationship between yield and digestibility of corn. So the digestibility of the grain or the starch component of corn is mainly influenced by crop maturity at harvest, kernel processing, moisture content at, at ensiling and time of ensiling. And the digestibility of the stover or the non-grain component of the corn is indicated by the NDFD value. And this is mainly influenced by genetics. And also we know that the BMR hybrids are more digestible than the standard hybrids. And I believe we've got some of those in the silage trials that, uh, that people can take a peek at. Uh, and the final question here, I guess, for today, uh, they're looking at a potential dry year coming and uh, looking for products with great roots. Uh, do you have any, does anyone have comments on, on that uh, consideration? Yes, the soil moisture looks dry if you look at the U.S. drought monitor, particularly in western Minnesota. Um, if one is worried about dry conditions, uh, look at ratings for drought tolerance and drought prone soils. In addition, uh, drought tolerant hybrids may be something to consider. They have been shown to produce similar yield as standard hybrids under favorable growing conditions, but produce greater yield than standard hybrids under drought conditions. And that's especially uh, true or has been shown when the drought conditions overlap pollination. I think that's good advice from Jeff. Uh, though, those hybrids and, and Certainly, if you want to pick something with good roots, but I remember the fall and early winter of 2012, we were much drier than we are now. And a lot of people were starting to think, oh, it's going to be a dry year. And we know when you move into the Dakotas, uh, people plant corn at a little bit lower population than we do here. And people were actually thinking about that. And they asked me about that. And I said, I would not do that. We have a very good chance of a spring soil recharge. Um, I would plan on 2021 being a very good corn year. If you plan on it being a dry year, I think you're, you're missing out on an opportunity that still could be there. Okay, good points, Tom. Uh, one last question I see popped into the chat here. Uh, kind of uh, looking for a guideline on um, if you want to be in the kind of top in terms of yield and, and being on the cutting edge, the question is about what kind of percent of your farm should you look at planting to a new variety every year? So, you know, kind of, I don't want to call it risking it, but kind of what percent would you, would you use something that's, that's brand new, I guess? I think I would take the advice of my seed dealer. And a lot of times, you know, some of the newer ones that they're, they're pretty proud of, often come out kind of limited. So you, you, may, you may be interested in one that they say is their new and probably highest yielding hybrid. You maybe only get enough to plant 50 or 100 acres. So that, that kind of thing. But uh, one thing you still got to use when you select hybrids is your own experience. And if you've had success with a hybrid, I wouldn't abandon it for something new just because it's new. So I wouldn't, uh, I would keep a lot of your farm on things that are a known commodity that you've had success with. Talk to your dealers about how much you should try of a new, new variety. And usually it's, it's gonna be limited by how much you can get. All right, well, thanks Tom. And I wanna thank Jeff and Dean, as well as everybody that's joined us today. Uh, that kind of wraps up our question and answer uh, session. Uh, we recorded today's episodes. So we'll be making that available online uh, later. But again, I want to thank everyone for participating. If you've got any feedback, uh, please send us a, a chat or you can send us an e email. 
Uh, and I want to thank Phyllis, who's been behind the scenes here, helping facilitate things today, as well as uh, I did post a link in the chat box to our, our Growing Corn website, and Phyllis has been instrumental in the in facilitating some of our online presence with some of this. And so I, that's a really well put together uh, website. It's got a lot of work that Tom and Jeff have worked on as well as uh, some of our soil fertility and things. And so uh, it's a link, it's got more information on, on some of the work that we've done at the U. And uh, with that, I wanna thank everyone and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much.